Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for the privilege of worship through the study of the word. We bless your name. We ask that you anoint your people tonight with eyes to see, ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves, vessels for your use. Yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. We bind you, Satan, all territorial spirits, strong man spirits, all familiars, ancestrals, disembodied spirits, all who project, all spirits not of the Holy Spirit. We're loosed, you're cast out. The saints said in agreement, amen. Well, we are talking about tripartite man, man that is spirit, soul, and body. We have in the past several weeks been talking about the soul man, or the soul, which is suke in the Greek, which means the mind, the will, the emotions. That part of our nature, or our being, I should say, which is our mind, will, and emotions. We talked about demonic oppression uh, in the soul. Uh, we have been of late talking about soul affliction, uh, not from demonic oppression, but from uh, the energizing of the appetites. The appetites belong both to the soul and to the body we said, and there are three appetites, the appetite for sleep, the appetite for food, and the appetite for sex. And we discussed at length how the enemy, how Satan and his kingdom take advantage of people, uh, take advantages of the flesh and the weakness of the flesh to energize the appetites to bring the soul into bondage. Huh? Okay, now why is it important? Because remember that when you got born again, it was your spirit man who got saved. The soul man is not yet saved. The soul man is in the process of being saved. So Satan will move in the appetites, will move in the thought life uh, of the soul, the mind, to try to hinder that salvation or stop that salvation, see? Now, why? Because of the fact that uh, the, soul pro the soul man salvation process is a lifetime process. Romans says, be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, huh? So that means the soul has to be transformed yet, huh? Okay? By the renewal of your mind. Remember what we said? Mind, will, emotions, is soul. So renewal of the mind means renewal of the soul, which means the soul needs to be renewed. See? It all falls together pretty logically, doesn't it? Okay? And so that's where that battle is. Now, in our last discussion, uh, we started out discussing, and I want to continue the, uh, tonight with this discussion, we started out in our last session discussing the remedies for dealing with the appetites, okay? We have already discussed the fact that the biblical meanings of the word flesh are uh, different than the biblical meaning for the word body, the, uh, that the word for many of these sins of the sexual appetite fall under the uh, term fornication, which means all sexual activities which are not uh, healthy vaginal intercourse in marriage. In other words, not uh, sexual activity ordained by God, see? That's where all the confusion is in the Christian church because people will say, well, you know, people who are married can do this and they can do that because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. That's a grave error, as I said before, because it's to use terminology according to the English language to interpret a biblical language of 2,000 years ago, and you can't do that. In, you have to think of the uh, uh, message, you have to think 
of God's position in the terms of the language that was used 2,000 years ago. And as I said before, to them there were only two kinds of sex, healthy sex in marriage, and everything that was good sex, and everything else was bad sex. Okay? And so that fell into the category of fornication. Okay? So let's continue our study now and complete our study on the remedy for these things and how God helps us to control the appetites. And by the way, let me tell you something. The appetites are the appetites. And just as there can be an, a lust for sex, there can be a lust for uh, food. There can be a lust for sleeping all the time. You see? And everything that is directed at uh, what I am going to say to finish our discussion on the appetite for sex and uh, soul afflictions of that appetite can also be applied to the appetite for food or the appetite to sleep. So keep that in mind, okay? Because God regards the appetites all the same uh, as far as their functions go. And remember what we said in earlier sessions that the way Satan creates abuse of the appetites is through lust. Huh? And lust is a wrongful desire or unholy desire. Huh? Okay? So turn with me now, if you will, and let's look at what God's position is in further dealing with the sins of the appetites. In Galatians 5, verse 24 and 25, we read, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the remedy that we are talking about then is to walk in the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and that is the way that you crucify the flesh and the affections and the lusts thereof. See? Now, that, by the way, also involves a faith confession. See? That's what Paul meant when he said, I die daily. Wasn't it? See? I die daily. Okay? Paul said that he had a war in his members. Okay? The members that Paul are talking about, the word members, remember now, we're dealing with the biblical language of 2,000 years ago. Okay? Members uh, are things which are attached and project from the body. Okay? Arms are members. Legs are members. The tongue is a member. Okay? The male genital organs are members. Okay? And all of those things fall into the category of members. So when Paul was talking in those terms, obviously uh, people would sin more with the tongue and more with their sexual organs than they would with their hands or their feet, wouldn't they? Do you see that? Okay? So that here his inference is he's talking about his own uh, sexual afflictions and his own sins of the tongue. See? And so we're going to look at this because, you see, God has a lot to say about it. Now, sometimes people get comfortable, or I'm sorry, people get uncomfortable, you know, talking about subjects like this, and they say, why does the pastor have to talk about this? Why does the pastor have to talk about that? You see, well, maybe you don't have a problem with this or that, so you don't see a need, okay? But I could tell you as a pastor that there are many people, male and female, who do have a problem with these things, you see? And we need to be gracious and unselfish in explaining to them how to overcome and how to get a victory in these areas of their life. Because every church 
worldwide is filled with people who are struggling with sins of the appetites, with sins of the flesh, with soul life problems. You see? And the Bible gives the remedy. So we discuss it because it's in the Bible. That's why. Okay? Why else? Because the things are put in the Bible not because they don't apply to us, but because they do apply to us. Huh? So that's why we bother to do this. Now, getting back to Galatians 5, 24 and 25, okay, notice that Paul talked about war in his members, okay, in the New Testament. And then he says, and I die daily, okay? Which, which means what? It meant that he had a daily prayer, a daily faith confession to, to handle the crucifixion of the flesh, okay? And each of us have to have that, okay? To keep the victory in our life, because if we don't, that old man that was put in the death work of the cross, uh, at the time we received Christ and had water baptism by immersion, that old man, guess what? Does not like to stay on the cross. It wants to get down off of the cross and take over, okay, and do again what it was doing before the person got saved, returning to the world, see? Okay, and there is only one way to stop that from happening, and that is by a faith confession, faith-filled words from the mouth confessing the continual crucifixion of that old self. See? Now that's an important concept to understand. Why? Because uh, in the Old Testament, the scripture talks about the keeping power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Okay? And so you would confess Something like this. You would say, uh, Father, in Christ Jesus' name, I bring the old man, the old self, my old self, to the cross this day, and I decree him crucified, uh, buried in the waters of immersion baptism, and yielded to the Holy Spirit to keep in the death work of the cross, in Jesus' name. Got it? See? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about, okay? So in this verse, when it says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. I bring that old man to the cross. I decree him crucified. See, it's an affirmation. It's a faith confession at the same time. I decree him crucified with all of his affections and lusts in the name and by the blood of Jesus. I decree him put in the death work of the cross. I yield him to the Holy Spirit to keep in the death work of the cross in Christ Jesus' name. See? Okay? So part of the remedy is, you see, uh, walking in the Spirit, doing the things of the Spirit. One of the things of the Spirit is faith confession, isn't it? You see? And faith confession brings possession, huh? So that's, this is how we, you know, we address that, okay? Well, then turn in uh, the next chapter of Galatian, Galatians, uh, to chapter 6, and look at verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting, Okay? Now, remember what the definition of the flesh was. The flesh had four meanings in New Testament scripture, in the Greek, okay? If you recall, uh, it meant the carnal nature, okay? It meant uh, uh, kin or relations, okay? It meant mankind, okay? and it meant the body, okay? But there is a more specific, uh, and by the body I mean the flesh of the body, okay? 
not the body uh, itself, because the body itself is another Greek word, which is more specific, and that is the word sarx, S-A-R-X. See? Okay? So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the word soma, S-O-M-A, okay, body, okay? Uh, uh, flesh is sarx, soma is body, okay? Now, understanding that, Okay, there is a distinction between the works of the flesh. See, God doesn't have uh, a problem with the flesh. He has a problem with the lusts of the flesh, the affections of the flesh, and the works of the flesh, the scripture says. Okay? That's an important concept to understand that when God refers to walking in the flesh, he's talking about all of the bad things of the flesh. Not that the flesh itself is evil or bad, because God created the flesh, and nothing that God creates is evil. Huh? You remember some weeks back we talked about that being part of the Manichaean heresy, of the early church of the first century, that a group had come in called the Manichaeans, and they had started to teach, they had started to proselytize among the Christians that the body or the flesh was evil. The body in the flesh is not evil. We must rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. The word of, tr of truth addresses the works of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, the affections of the flesh. In other words, the preferences of the flesh. If you want to use a, a wastebasket term that is not in the Bible but would... Uh, 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 I guess, uh, cover all three, okay? So, when it says that if we sow to the flesh, uh, shall of the flesh reap corruption, here it is talking about the preferences of the flesh. See, the flesh being what it is has no interest in the spirit, does it? Hmm? Okay? Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, The flesh striveth against the spirit, and the spirit striveth against the flesh. Okay? Here it's talking about those preferences again. It's, uh, the implication here is the works, the uh, lusts, and the affections. See? That the scripture speaks of. Uh, going uh, to strive against the Holy Spirit. Now notice that that's, there it is referring to the carnal nature of the soul life. Okay? That because the soul life is not, the soul is not totally saved, there is an aspect of the soul which left to itself will agree with the flesh, will agree with the old man, okay? That is the carnal nature, what we call the carnal nature, the nature that wants to do works of the flesh, that wants to have lust of the flesh, that wants to have the affections of the flesh, see? Okay, and so, here it says in Galatians 6, 8, he that soweth to that will reap corruption. Okay? Now, basically, what that means is death, physical death. Okay? Not just uh, uh, solical death or damage, but physical death. Okay? He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Okay? But here's some good news. Okay, and it's in Romans 8. Let's turn to Romans 8. Okay. Let's read verses 2 to 14. And this is what it says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, 
you need to be aware that the danger of the appetites or the afflictions of the appetites can lead you as a born-again, spirit-filled Christian into walking your Christian faith walk under the wrong law. See, there are two laws which operate, the law of sin and death, and if you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. In other words, you can be born again, spirit-filled, and still be living a carnal life, uh, doing and following and pursuing the works and efforts of the flesh or living in the world, okay, and doing what the world is doing, what Jesus uh, called the broad road or the broad way, huh? Okay, and that is this way, and that will seed uh, sin, and it will seed death in your life. That was the problem with the Corinthian church, wasn't it? Huh? A church of saved people who were just powerful in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and just powerful in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they were extremely carnal and sexual. See? And so Paul had to go down to them and talk to them. Okay? Why? Because they uh, did not understand that you could be walking in the Spirit, okay, and still be fulfilling the law of sin and death. Isn't that something? And we have in the church, lots of people, okay, who are walking in the Spirit, in gifts, in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay, but uh, they are under the law of sin and death. They are in the death cycle of the faith walk. See, God wants you not in the death cycle of the faith walk, he wants you in the life cycle of the faith walk. Not only having eternal life because of the fact that you're saved, okay, but physical life here, a full life here, okay, while you're in the physical body. That's God's will, for you to have long life and good health because those are two of the promises of the of the Abrahamic covenant, which God has given you and me as we are grafted in to the covenant with Abraham as were the Jews. The Gentiles were grafted in, you see? And so, what we understand by this is that there is another law operational, the law of the spirit of life in Christ which is walking your faith walk in the life cycle. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ is the law of grace. Grace is a law like faith is a law. See? And grace is what? God's favor to you, his love to you, his power to you, his victory to you, his maturing or perfecting of you, all of which is given, we cannot earn it and we cannot deserve it. That's what makes grace, grace. That there is nothing we can do to get it. See? God is a gracious God. Huh? Okay? And so when we are depending on Christ, okay, leaning on Christ, depending on him, trusting him, which is faith. We are saved by grace through faith, and everything in the kingdom we are to receive, we receive by grace through faith. See? So our victory over the appetites comes by grace, God's favor to us through faith, by yielding and depending on him to cause us 
to walk in the life cycle. See? Not by self-effort. Because if you have sins of the appetites, and I'm grouping them all together now, whether it's food or sex or whether it's sleep or whatever, if you have sins of the appetite and you plan to make it your personal battle, okay, guess what? It's not going to work. And you're going to fall flat on your face. See? And you'll get up and you'll fall flat on your face. You'll get up, you'll fall flat on your face. And then finally you'll say to God, God, I can't do it. I give up. And then God will say, now I can do something. See? And he will step in. So that the law of sin and death stops and the law of grace or the spirit of life in Christ takes over. See? So it's done by yielding and trusting God to work it in you and through you. Remember, the scripture says uh, in the New Testament that we are ready to judge all things when our obedience is made complete. Now, notice what that scripture says. It doesn't say when you become obedient. In other words, it doesn't say that this is a work that comes from your self-effort. No. It is something being worked in you by Christ. His life, our body, the scripture says. Remember we read that? His life, our body. He lives his life in us and through us as we relate to him in his grace to effect change in us. Okay? So our obedience is made complete by him. He who has begun a good work in you is able to bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Who will do it? He will do it. Huh? One uh, Peter 5.10, after you've suffered a while, the God of all grace, he will establish, strengthen, settle, and perfect you. Who will do it? He will do it. Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at work in you to do his will and good pleasure. Who will do it? He will do it. Huh? Psalm 138, verse 8, he will perfect all things concerning me. Who will do it? He will do it. See, scripture is very clear, okay, as to how we overcome. We don't overcome through our own effort. We overcome through Jesus. See? He is Savior. The word Savior means deliverer. Huh? And the more we lean on him, the more he strengthens us, the more we'd get delivered, right? Okay, that's how the faith walk works, folks. Okay, now let's look at Romans 8, 2, and let's go a little deeper as we talk about the remedy. Part of the remedy is understanding your position in Christ, see, as well. And it says, starting with uh, uh, Romans 8, verses 2 to 14, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Grace has made you free. Grace has made me free. See? Okay? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He restricted the power of sin to the flesh. Huh? Okay. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay. How is the righteousness of the law fulfilled in you? How do you keep the law? How do you, this is telling you how you keep the Old Testament, right here. Read it again. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. 
When you walk after the Spirit, you are keeping the righteousness of the law. Isn't that something? Okay, why? Because the law is fulfilled in Jesus. Huh? By his Spirit. See? Okay? And it continues. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now here is the law of sin and death, the law that follows the carnal mind. Okay? The law of the spirit of life in Christ follows being spiritually minded. Okay? Dwelling on the things of the spirit. Okay? So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's the good news. The next verse. Verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Wow. How about that? Okay? Okay. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. How about that? And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. In other words, what this is saying is that if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is in you, he shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. The word quicken is an old English word which means make alive. Okay? And how does the Holy Spirit make alive? He makes alive by the finished work of the cross. Huh? There is a life work, of, there's a death work of the cross, and there is a life work of the cross. Jesus dying on the cross is only half the story. Huh? The resurrection is the rest of it. Huh? And if you're a spirit-filled Christian, you don't focus on the death and passion of Jesus. You recognize the importance of it. You acknowledge the importance of it. Okay? But you don't focus and dwell on it like some people do because it's the everlasting resurrected Christ, the Christ of power, who is on the earth today by the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and who will come again in glory. You see? And we preach the resurrected Christ, don't we? You see? And, uh, and I don't mean by those remarks by any means to belittle the what Christ had to go through, okay, uh, for us and pay the price for us. We were bought for a price. I, you know, we all need to be aware of that, okay, and be thankful and grateful and, and, and full of praise for that. But what I am trying to say here is that what the Spirit by Paul is saying in this verse is that there is a death work of the cross and there is a life work of the cross and because of that life work of the cross the Holy Spirit quickens, makes alive your body also. See, there in, in too many religious circles there has been the teaching that the body is unholy or the body is sinful or the body is dirty. Okay? But that's not true. The work of the cross is complete. Colossians 2.10 says, You are complete in him. And what people don't understand 
is that the human body is not evil, okay? That here it says that the Holy Spirit will quicken or make alive your body. In other words, when Jesus paid the price on the cross, okay, and he redeemed man, he redeemed the total man. Spirit, soul, body. He redeemed tripartite man. Okay, when you got born again, the spirit man immediately and completely was perfected. The soul man is being perfected. The body will be totally perfected at the, re uh, at the uh, second coming when the body is redeemed for a glory, or the rapture, when the body is redeemed for a glorified body, right? But as far as the payment of sin is concerned, the work of the cross is complete. That includes the body, you see? And we have to have a right perspective about that in a healthy uh, understanding of what is what in the scripture, okay? When it says the body in scripture, the body will be redeemed, that means it will be exchanged for a glorified one, okay? But we are in the process. See, all of that was done at the cross. It's finished. The last words that came out of Jesus' mouth was, it is finished, okay? Now, remember that that was a work done in the realm of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, right? We are in the realm of space and time, the physical universe, okay? And so these things are being worked out from the spiritual to the physical, okay? But that doesn't mean that the payment in full has not taken place because Scripture says it has. It is finished. It is complete. Okay, and so for that reason, in Colossians 2.10, Paul by the Spirit says, you are complete in him. Hmm? You are complete in him. See, not by yourself, but in him. See, you are complete spiritually, you are complete solically, or as far as your mind, will, and emotions are concerned. You are complete physically, as far as your body is concerned. Okay? The only thing left is a trade-in at the rapture, say, for a glorified one. Okay? Now, what is the point? If you are complete in him, and if the work of salvation, which means deliverance, healing, and being saved from sin, if, you, uh, if that is finished and you are complete in him, that means that there is only one thing left to do, and that is take possession of it. See? Because everything in the kingdom operates by grace through faith. Huh? How did you get saved? You said, I want that. And you took possession of it. That's grace through faith. Now, what do you need? A healing? You need freedom from this sin or that sin? You need or from this problem of the appetite or that problem of the appetite? Okay. You take possession by grace through faith. And faith involves a faith confession. Okay? And speaking it so that that uh, high priest of ours goes before the Father, and he is high priest of our confession, You've, as you heard me say before, confesses your words to the Father, which fulfill the law of the spirit of life in Christ. We're walking in the life cycle. When we faith confess, that's how you walk in the life cycle, by faith confession. And in so doing, uh, the Father hears faith, he's a faith God, he releases the grace from the throne to the person, and that grace has the power to overcome a problem. 
a behavior, a sin, a need. See? And that's how we take possession. See, by letting Christ live his life as high priest in us and through us. Okay, well, let's continue. Okay, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He will make alive your mortal bodies. See? So your body is holy and becomes the temple of God. Okay? For if ye, for therefore, brethren, you are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Notice it doesn't say, if you mortify the body. Hmm? Okay, you know, we have religious types out there who are in these religious orders and they flagellate themselves with whips and things like that. Have you ever seen that or read about that or heard about that? You know, or they cloister themselves behind gates and they don't speak to the outside world and all they do is pray all day long. They're so super spiritual, they have no earthly good to anybody. Jesus never did that. Jesus was always out with the people ministering life to the people. You see, that other stuff is religion, okay? People that uh, uh, wear things like belts that have nails and things like this to mortify their body uh, or uh, whip themselves. They have certain uh, orders of priests that will flagellate themselves with a whip Okay, and I'm not talking about Catholic. This occurs, in, yeah, it does occur in the Catholic Church, but it occurs in the Orthodox Church. Okay, uh, I don't know if it occurs in the Protestant churches or not. Okay, but what are they doing? They're mortifying their bodies, aren't they? Okay, to keep their bodies under submission. Okay, because they take to an extreme the words of Paul that he beat his body under submission, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, but the clarification, that was Paul doing that. <laughs> okay, but, huh? No, I don't think it was an idiom. But, but uh, at any rate, notice here the clarification by the Spirit. Okay, and that is we mortify the deeds of the body, not the body, okay? Remember that we said in the past in spiritual warfare that one of the techniques that uh, demonic spirits use, particularly religious spirits, is displacement or twisting the idea of the scripture to get your mind off of something and on something else. Say that's what happens in these religious orders. They think the body is evil, and they start flagellating or whipping themselves to keep the body in submission, okay, and things like this. And the scripture is clear. The body is not evil, okay? It's the deeds of the body that are to be mortified, not the body. But that religious spirit that works in their thought life gets them off of the deeds of the body and gets them on the body. You see what I'm saying? That's displacement. And that's a very common uh, technique that uh, evil spirits use. Uh, okay? Therefore, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, I think we're going to stop there uh, for this evening because we've... Uh, covered a lot of material, but we have, we have uh, a considerable amount to discuss 
yet uh, as far as the spiritual remedy for the uh, sins of the appetites are concerned. So uh, let's just uh, stop here for tonight because it's convenient to do so. We're going to get into uh, another aspect of this in our next session. Uh, so we give you thanks, praise, and glory, Lord Jesus Christ, for the move of your spirit here tonight and for the truth of your word. May it get into our spirit, man, Lord, and may we teach it to others that the church would grow in glory and in truth. In your name we pray. The saints said in agreement. Amen. Amen. Anybody want to ask?